I'm Bess Marcus, the Dean of the School of Public Health here at Brown, and we're delighted to have all of you here today um, to talk about such an important topic about climate change and environmental health. We have two amazing faculty who are going to tell you a lot that will make you scared and sad and a lot about what you can do to take action to make a difference um, for your generation and your children and your grandchildren and beyond. So I think it's going to be a really exciting, um, exciting presentation. So obviously you're all here because you care about this and um, you'd really have to literally have your head in the sand to not be hearing about erratic weather and climate change from the major storms to hearing in the political world about the Green New Deal to all the warnings um, from the recent fourth national climate assessment and intergovernmental panel on climate change, the global warming report. There's a lot of information about, out there and, and our faculty will help you sort out um, what's, what's really happening. So here at Brown, our public health researchers have shown that, for example, taking inaction um, around heat warnings is a huge problem. And you'll hear some about um, how the work they've done has actually changed policy on when people need to go, to go to cooling stations, particularly children, older adults, people who aren't well, who can be quite um, vulnerable during extreme heat, and we're having more and more extreme heat. Even the people who are the so-called climate deniers recognize it, we're having erratic weather events. Um, and so, um, so there's, there's important policy level changes that have been going on and hopefully will continue to. Um, with also really important work about toxic chemicals, heavy metals, air pollution, noise, all kinds of other um, threats to our health. And particularly, health, um, you know, at the School of Public Health, we focus a lot on vulnerable populations, um, pregnant women, children, um, older adults, and those who aren't well. And um, in, in all of these groups who have so many challenges anyway, have that many more challenges with extreme weather. And, you know, you've heard about a lot of national issues, you know, the Flint water crisis, for example, um, and so many other challenges to our environment, and so many challenges that we can't see, and we don't know that they're happening, or we might not know that they're happening until it's late to do something. Um, we, we know that there's impaired cognitive development in children who grow up near highways. Um, we know there's all kinds of chemical exposures that we're all ex you know, exposed to, including in the um, products, the face products we put on our skin, that some of the sunscreens that we're doing to protect us might also be putting us at risk for other things. So this is a huge part of the national conversation. And I'm really proud that in our new strategic plan, one of the main areas we'll be focusing on in the school is climate change and environmental health. Um, and at, we really focus again on a social, you know, you're all brown people are connected to brown. So that social justice ethos, I'm sure, was part of what happened while you were here and why you're here today. And that really runs deep in our work on, on climate and the environment. Um, so, you know, Greg Willenius is the chair um, and director of our Center for Environmental Health and Technology, and Joe Braun um, also in that department, and our Department of Epidemiology works in that group. So we have a whole center focused on this particular topic. Um, and so I'm going to turn things over to Greg and Joe. Again, Dr. Willenius is a contributing author of the recent Fourth National Climate Assessment, and he is going to discuss how our rapidly changing climate affects the way we live, work, and play, and what we can do to minimize those impacts. Dr. Braun is an international leader in the field and will discuss the threats that environmental chemical exposures pose to human health including the ways common household chemical exposures before conception, during pregnancy, infancy, and childhood affect risk across the lifespan. So um, please join me in, in welcoming our colleagues. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you, Dean Marcus. It is such a privilege uh, to uh, uh, be speaking to you today about what I think is a, uh, a super important topic. Uh, I've been at Brown for just about 10 years, coming up on my 10-year anniversary. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology, and my research program is broadly on uh, trying to identify how to build 
communities that we all live in that are healthy, sustainable, and resilient. So more than 70% of Americans live in urban environments, and more than 50% of the population around the world lives in urban environments, and we know actually very little about how to build those cities in such a way as to promote health and uh, minimize risk. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk about uh, a particular part of my research program, which is on climate change and how that affects your health. Now, I know that this can seem uh, pretty overwhelming at times because we're bombarded in the media by images such as what you see here. So, uh, you know, hurricanes that are uh, damaging our, our cities and putting our lives at risk, wildfires that, that are, are, seems like they're every year they're, they're more destructive and more prevalent and the fire season lasts longer and longer, major heat waves that affect much of the US, and even what's the so-called nuisance flooding. This isn't during a major storm, this is just during astronomical high tides in some cities, uh, some coastal cities. So the, we're, we're just flooded by images like this, and it's not just other people, right? This isn't other people's problems, this is our problem here in Rhode Island. We have 400 miles of coastline in Rhode Island. This is the uh, Coast Guard uh, House restaurant, uh, in Narragansett, uh, extensively damaged during Hurricane Sandy. And then this, this wasn't a, a, a major weather event, this was rain. This was, you know, several days of very heavy rain in 2010, the sort of the Great Flood, it's sometimes called. Uh, uh, and, and so this is, you know, very severe flooding during a non-extreme event. Same thing in, in the uh, South Boston. Uh, you often see uh, flooding during astronomical high tides with particular confluence of conditions that seem to be happening more and more often. So then we're flooded by headlines like this one, that the uh, US had its warmest May on record. That was from, from 2018. Uh, Canada warming at twice the global rate. Uh, and the climate change is even fueling the border crisis uh, on our southern border. Uh, the US government, yes, the US government released a 1,500-page report detailing the causes and consequences of climate change on, on our health and our economy. Uh, the current administration, this was last in November. Uh, so it's very easy and natural to sort of feel overwhelmed by all this information and it's all doom and gloom and it's such a big problem that it's human nature to sort of shut down a little bit and say, wow, that's a big problem that I, I can't possibly make a difference, I can't possibly do something about that. And I'm here to tell you that it's actually pretty simple. So this is uh, the advice from Ed Maybach, uh, who uh, does a, a ton of research on climate change communication. And his message is actually super simple in 10 words, okay? It's real, it's us, experts agree, it's bad, and most importantly, there's hope. So let's dig into each of these a little bit. Okay, so it's real. So many of you will have observed with your own eyes that we have more days of really hot weather, more extreme and more frequent heat waves, these very extreme cold waves that we sometimes get, the polar vortex you now hear about that, at least when I was a kid I never heard it yet, uh, about such things, more wildfires, more extreme storms. This is just showing average global temperatures increasing in the last uh, 100 years uh, across the globe, uh, rainfall patterns changing dramatically, the evidence is overwhelming that the climate is changing, the climate has changed and is projected to continue to change. Uh, here is the cause of it, it's us. These are carbon dioxide levels uh, uh, which we've, in the atmosphere which we've been measuring since 1958. Uh, you can see this week it hit 415 uh, parts per million. When I was a kid it was in the low 300s. So that's a substantial change and in fact it's the highest levels in more than 10,000 years. So carbon dioxide levels have increased and as that happens the global average temperature has been increasing dramatically as well. But you don't need to take my word for it because now there's even research on what climate scientists think. Okay, so I don't have to you know, convince you that, that the climate science is real and that climate change is real and that it's happening. Turns out that the research shows that 97% of the world's experts on this topic actually agree that climate change is real and that these changes are due, by and large, to human activity. Uh, there's uh, government reports, including from the, office, uh, the White House Office of Science, Technology, and Policy under the current administration in the form of the National Climate Assessment just released in November, saying climate change is real 
and it's having these import, very important, dramatic consequences on, the, uh, on our lives. Uh, governments uh, and intergovernment agencies around the world, the US National Academies of Science, Engineering, uh, and Medicine, which brings together the country's leading uh, experts on a range of topics, and dozens, if not hundreds, of scientific and medical societies across the world agree climate change is real, and it's due to human activity. There's also broad agreement that it's bad. Okay, so in terms of the environmental changes, we have more heavy rains, more floods, more severe storms, uh, impacts on heat waves and even extreme cold, uh, droughts, wildfires, we talked about already, important impacts on air pollution, and of course, uh, uh, very well known impacts on sea level rise. What's a little bit less recognized is that we live in this environment, so as the environment changes, it threatens our health and well-being, and not just our physical health and well-being, but also our economic health and well-being. Okay, so there's a, a range of, of health-related outcomes uh, or, or impacts. Uh, again, this isn't you know, about penguins and polar bears and small Pacific islands. This is about your family, your neighbors, your community. How much more asthma do you want in your community? How much more Lyme disease do you want in your community? Uh, so the, these are uh, uh, very, uh, uh, important and diverse set of, of health impacts. And most of my research actually focuses on quantifying it. So we know these things happen, and we don't have really good numbers on it. How many more people die of heat because of the changing climate? How many more uh, uh, asthma attacks? How many more days of missed school for your kids because they don't feel well do we have, uh, et cetera? So we can put a number on it. The, the tools, the research tools are there, and that's what most of my work is, is trying to do now. And there's also you know, very important economic impacts. Uh, skiing in New England is harder now. It's harder to run a profitable ski hill now than it was 30 to 50 years ago because of the rising temperatures. Uh, the fisheries are, are under great threat. Even things that we don't think about, sort of recreational waters and you know, maple syrup season, all shifting because of the changing ecosystem. So the changing environment is very important, but it's primarily important, in my opinion, because we live, work, and play in this environment, and it's affecting our well-being. So what can we do about it? So this research, if you can put a number on how many more people are dying of certain things under climate change, then one of the things that you can do is inform local policy. So uh, in a, a, a project in collaboration uh, with our neighboring states in New England, uh, including the Department of Health here in Rhode Island, uh, we showed that, in fact, when it's really hot out, people go to the emergency department and die uh, at even below when the National Weather Service issues a heat warning to tell you that it's hot outside. Okay, so we took that information to the National Weather Service and they were very receptive to it and said, yeah, that's great, let's change the policy. So now instead of treating all of the northeastern US as huge areas having one set of criteria for issuing heat warnings, starting in summer 2017, they've divided it so that New England, uh, New Englanders have uh, less air conditioning and are perhaps less accustomed to hot temperatures, so now, those of us in New England have uh, heat warnings are issued at a lower temperature than they were uh, prior to this. So if we can develop the evidence to drive policy, then the policymakers are willing to respond to that and uh, uh, move towards a more protective policy. So there's hope. Uh, we have a choice as a global society. It's not a foregone conclusion that the climate needs to keep changing at the pace at which it's changing today. Okay, we can, as a, again, as a global society, we can choose whether we want to stay on this trajectory, this business as usual, lots more warming through the end of the century, or whether we want to level off global greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, now that's hard, but a first starting point from my perspective is to provide the information. It, we always talk about what is the cost of mitigating, what is the cost of emitting fewer greenhouse gas emissions? And what we don't usually do is talk about the cost of not doing that in terms of human lives. So here, this is one of the images we contributed to the National Climate Assessment that was published. We show here in Rhode Island, we have more days of extreme high heat, and that on those days of extreme high heat, the relative risk of going to the emergency room goes up quite a bit. And then we can put a number on, okay, if we continue emitting greenhouse gases as, uh, at the current rate, we're gonna have a lot more emergency room visits for, for heat-related diseases, whereas if we 
emit fewer greenhouse gases, we can actually prevent some of those. So you can put a number. What is the benefit in terms of human lives of reducing greenhouse gas emissions? This is just one tiny slice of that, but you can imagine if we do that across health impacts, then you can see that the, the human benefits of mitigating greenhouse gas emissions can start to become huge. So the other reason that there's hope is because there's actually, notwithstanding what you hear on the news, there's actually a tremendous amount of action both at the global level and at the very local level. So at the global level, you'll remember from 2015, there was the uh, uh, Paris Agreement or Paris Accords that uh, basically almost every country in the world agreed to uh, a, a voluntary program of reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Now, yes, there's, you know, uh, the, the, the U.S. future in that program or in that agreement is uncertain, uh, but, but the fact that you can get almost every country in the world to sign on to this was huge and really a moment to celebrate. So that's at the global stage, but even on the local stage, so this is from a nearby Massachusetts community uh, where they've uh, uh, done a program called Power Aggregation and to ensure that every residential customer gets at least 60% of their power from renewable sources with the option for marginally more money to get up to 100% renewable uh, power. So in the news, you often hear that uh, uh, there's climate believers and deniers. And of course, the world isn't that simple. There's actually a spectrum of uh, you know, people that are alarmed or concerned about climate change uh, to people that are doubtful or dismissive. And the other piece of good news here is that we don't have to uh, uh, deal with a very small but vocal minority of truly climate deniers. All we need to do to change policy is get these people to be active and, and vote, and then to move some of the people that are disengaged or doubtful, just a few of them, more over into the cautious or concerned category. So it's not nearly as bleak that there's this large community of climate deniers. They're not. They're vocal, but, uh, uh, but it's a relatively small uh, community. So how are we going to actually do this change? So, uh, so Ed Maybach again says, every major public health victory in the last century has had effective communication at its heart. And he suggests we need to have a simple, clear message repeated often but by a variety of trusted voices. And it turns out that many of you are trusted voices in some part of your community, whether you are in government, whether you're in business, whether you're a clinician that sees uh, patients, whether you're a lawyer that has clients, whether you're uh, a small business owner, uh, you have a voice in your community. And just starting to have these conversations saying, this is not about the environment, this is not about the penguins and the polar bears, this is about what kind of future do we want for our kids? And so delivering that message is super important just on the one-to-one one -one basis. And I teach a course here on climate change and human health that some of your kids might have taken. And I see some of my students already in the class. And uh, you know, the, the key point of that class is really to learn to communicate to review the evidence for yourself, assess the evidence for yourself, and then communicate what you believe to your family, friends, and neighbors. And there's hope because I see the social awareness and the environmental awareness in the next generation. This is from my kids' school where I've presented something similar to this to say, hey, climate change is really important and you can be part of the solution. And the kids have a, a social consciousness that uh, was never taught to me when I was a kid. So it's really nice to see this at, at the middle school level now. Uh, and there's things you can do in your everyday life. So besides being a messenger, you can uh, reduce your carbon footprint. And if we all do a little bit of this, we're not talking about giving up your cars or never flying again. We're talking about making small changes in each of our lives that in aggregate make a big difference. Even something like eating one less meal of red meat per we can have a huge impact on uh, the, uh, the carbon footprint of the country. So I encourage you to, to sort of identify what small steps, what incremental steps you can take in your life, uh, and then to also help your community and neighbors and friends to make similar changes in their lives. And the great thing about this is that if you do any of these things, it helps your health and the health of, of your neighbors, not in 100 years, not in 50 years, but today. So these are the climate co-benefits of things that we can do. So every time you drive less because you took public transportation or you biked or, uh, or you carpooled with a friend, you reduce your emissions not only of carbon dioxide, but also of other air pollutants that are harmful to you today. And so that you know, we can do these things 
things to achieve cleaner air, cleaner water, healthy children, energy independence, et cetera. We can do these things today uh, as well as to leave a better future for our kids. So I'll stop there, and at the end, I'd be happy to take questions. Good job. Can everyone hear me? Great. So um, I'm going to talk to you. Uh, I'm Joe Braun. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology. And I've been at Brown now for seven years. And I uh, study the causes and consequences of environmental chemical exposures in pregnant women, infants, children, and adolescents. I actually got here. As a, starting as a school nurse in inner city Milwaukee, where I worked at an elementary school and middle school in the inner city, and I really began to, I really appreciated what environment meant there. And not just in the sense of chemicals, but seeing that children come from this diverse array of environments, from very impoverished to still poor, and yet there was this huge range of abilities in what kids could do and of their health states. And it wasn't always related to their environment. Sometimes there were just some kids that were more resilient, um, and there were other kids who weren't. And so that really gave me an appreciation for uh, thinking about how environment impacts our health and made me want to continue to study how environment impacts children's health. So I have three key messages. They're not 10 words or less. Um, but they are um, that the fetus and child is more sensitive to the environment than adults. That we're exposed to a mixture of environmental chemicals across the lifespan. And we know very little about the health effects of these chemicals. And that chemical exposures can imp impact children's health in addition to adult health. So I want to start with a story about a pharmaceutical called diethylstilbestrol, or DES. DES was a drug given to pregnant women in the 1940s to 1970s to prevent preterm birth and stillbirth. Now, it turned out later on that studies conducted found that it didn't prevent these things, but it continued to be given to 5 to 10 million pregnant women over those uh, decades. And in the 1960s, Dr. Arthur Herbst up at Massachusetts General Hospital identified a cluster of eight young, um, eight, eight adolescents and young girls who had developed vaginal clear cell carcinoma. Now, this is an incredibly rare cancer that only affects women um, in their late 50s or postmenopausal women. And yet, here they were. Here, this cancer cluster was appearing in these young girls and um, young adults. And so, he conducted a small study and found that seven out of the eight cases had mothers who took this drug during pregnancy. And none of the girls and young adults who did not um, have this disease had mothers who took this drug. So his d data seemed to provide evidence that DES was causing vaginal clear cell carcinoma. And this is actually mirroring a trend happening across the nation. And here I'm just sh showing you the number of millions of pills of the drug sold um, annually between 1945 and 1970, and then the, the number of cases of vaginal clear cell carcinoma 20 years later. And what you can see is that the number of pills sold increases, so too did the number of cases of vaginal clear cell carcinoma. And then as the number of pills sold decreases, so too did the number of cases of vaginal clear cell carcinoma. So this provided very compelling evidence that there was this causal relationship between diethylstilbestrol exposure during pregnancy and the daughter's reproductive health later on in life. And a series of studies conducted by the National Cancer Institute and others in the subsequent decades, they found that DES exposure during pregnancy was associated with a wide array of adverse uh, reproductive health outcomes in the daughters. This included increased risk of breast cancer, increased risk of pregnancy loss and stillbirth of their children, increased risk of preterm birth, and a whole host of other um, adverse reproductive health outcomes. What they found that was really interesting is that these daughters who were exposed had changes in the cells of their vaginal epithelium and their uterine muscles. That then these changes could have only occurred during fetal development or embryonic development when these uh, girls would have been exposed, when these women would have been exposed to DES during pregnancy, during their mother's pregnancy. So this provided very compelling evidence that DES was actually causing changes in the reproductive tract of these women during pregnancy, and then this was increasing their risk of adverse reproductive health outcomes later on in life. And there's been um, more studies conducted now to date showing that there may actually be intergenerational effects of these exposures. And so do, um, children uh, born to uh, children whose grandmothers use DES have 30% increased risk of having ADHD in one study. So think about that. What your grandmother did during her pregnancy affects 
her grandchildren's risk of certain diseases, in this case, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now, this is one study and it needs to be replicated, but um, it's a very uh, provocative idea. And it suggests that our ancestral exposures could be just as important as those exposures that we're experiencing now. So DES is just one uh, chemical in a broad class of chemicals we call endocrine disruptors. Um, and DES shares a structural similarity with an uh, endogenous hormone in our body called estradiol. And so too do another uh, um, suite of chemicals that we've been exposed to historically, things like the organochlorine pesticide DDT, uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, bisphenol A, which you've heard about, or BPA, and among others. These chemicals can inter interact with our, um, with our uh, endocrine system to affect the metabolism, excretion, or action of hormones in our body, and thus may, it, they may also impact human health. Now, it's important to note that these chemicals weren't designed to have biologic activity. This is a byproduct of their design for use in industry or commerce. So they often are much less potent than drugs like DES. Now, we're not just exposed to one of these chemicals at a time. We're exposed to dozens, if not hundreds of them, from the day we're conceived until the day we die. And this is some data from pregnant women here in the United States. And this figure here is showing you 54 bars, where each bar represents a pregnant woman in the United States. The height of the bar indicates the number of chemicals detected in the blood or urine of these women. So, and the different colors correspond to different classes of chemicals that these women had in their blood or urine. So phthalates, which are found in personal care products, organochlorine pesticides, metals, et cetera. What you can see is that there's no women who have exposure to nothing. The minimum number of chemicals detected in the blood or urine of these women was 27. And on average, 38 chemicals were detected in the blood or urine of these women. So this indicates that pregnant women are exposed to a mixture of environmental chemicals. And many of these chemicals can cross the placenta and affect the developing fetus. So here at Brown, our research group is trying to understand what the health effects of these chemical exposures are when the fetus, infant, child, or adolescent is exposed. And we're studying a wide array of environmental chemicals, from the pesticides that are applied to our foods, to the phthalates in our personal care products, to things like air pollution um, and things in air pollutants, as well as phenols like, um, poly like bisphenol A or flame retardants that are added to our furniture and electronics. Now we're doing this work using three prospective cohort studies. So a cohort study is where we enroll a group of people and follow them over time and observe what happens to them. Because we can't conduct randomized trials of these types of chemical exposures. No one in this room would voluntarily want to be exposed to bisphenol A or to diethylstilbestrol, right? So we, what, what we have to do is we enroll pregnant women or we enroll them before they become pregnant and we measure levels of chemicals in their blood or urine and then we follow them and their children over time. And in these three cohorts here in North America, we've been doing this in about 1,500 uh, mother-child pairs. And we've measured chemical concentrations in both the mothers and the children, and then measuring the health of the children as they get older. And in some of these cohorts now, we've been following them, the children, until they're 12 years old and are trying to continue following them as, they're, as they get even older in adolescence and early adulthood. So I'm going to give you an example of some of the work we've been doing and um, frame this in the context of the obesity epidemic that's affecting us. 17% of children in the United States are obese, and there's concern that chemical exposures might be making us fat. These, are, these chemical exposures we call obesogens. And this is a picture here from Retha Newbold's laboratory at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences where she exposed pregnant rats to diethylstilbestrol or not. One of these rats is very skinny, and one of these rats is fat. Can you guess which rat got DES exposure during pregnancy? So there's been a number of studies now showing that DES exposure is associated with or causes obesity in rodent studies or in humans. And there's a concern that other environmental chemicals may be doing this to us as well. So we've been studying a class of chemicals called perfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS, and whether or not they are causing uh, increased risk of childhood obesity. PFAS are a class of thousands of chemicals used in industry or commerce. And you're probably most fam familiar with them for their use in stain and water repellent textiles like Gore-Tex or other uh, technical fabrics, as well as their use in uh, creating a Teflon cookware or nonstick cookware. And these chemicals can hang around in the environment for decades, if not centuries. And the reason they do this is because of their, um, this long carbon chain that's fluorinated. The carbon fluoride bond is the strongest bond out there. 
And that makes these chemicals highly resistant to thermical, thermal chemical and biological degradation. And in humans, some of these chemicals can hang around in our blood for years. So all of us in this room have detectable levels of the, this chemical and this chemical, which is PFOA on the top and PFOS on the bottom. Now, we've been studying the patterns of this, uh, chemical, these chemical exposures in children from the home study, which is a pregnancy and birth cohort study in Cincinnati, Ohio that I work with. And we measured PFOA and PFOS levels in the blood of children when they were born, so in their cord blood, and then again when they were three and eight years of age. And one of the interesting things we found is that children's levels increased from birth to three years of age and then decreased. And what we found is that this was mostly driven by the fact that children who are breastfed longer have higher levels of these chemicals because it's being passed from the mother to the child via breast milk. And in fact, children, born, children who are breastfed for 12 or more months had PFOA and PFOS levels in their blood that were twice as high as children who were not breastfed. Now I want to stop and make it really clear that I'm not saying we shouldn't breastfeed our children. The benefits of breastfeeding outweigh any of the risks that might be associated with these chemical exposures that we know about. But what this does make clear is that even when we have the best intentions for our children, breastfeeding them, making sure that they're washing their hands or, or you know, using personal care products to keep them clean, that they may be inadvertently exposed to these chemicals. And that this means we need to have sensible regulations and policies in place to ensure that we aren't using these chemicals in places where they shouldn't be, or that we're taking steps to reduce exposure in vulnerable populations. We've done work looking at what the relationship is between these perfluoroalkyl substances and a variety of anthropometry outcomes in these children, so how heavy they are, how long they are, how, how tall they are, as well as how much body fat they have had. And one of the interesting things we did find was that children who were born to mothers with higher levels of PFOA in their blood during pregnancy were more likely to be overweight or obese in childhood and to have more body fat. And in fact, some of the children with higher exposure on average had one to two extra pounds of fat on their body compared to children with lower exposure during pregnancy. <clears throat> and this here is showing you how these children grew over time between two and eight years of age as a function of their mom's um, PFOA concentrations during pregnancy. So this black solid line are children who had the, whose mothers had the lowest concentrations of PFOA in their blood during pregnancy. And they gained a relatively small amount of BMI or adiposity between two and eight years of age. But children whose mothers had medium or high levels of PFOA in their blood grew very differently. And actually they accrued more fat mass faster between two and eight years of age compared to the children in that, in that um, lowest exposed group. Now this mirrors another environmental exposure that we're very familiar with and have studied in depth. And this is tobacco smoke exposure during pregnancy. Babies born to mothers who smoke during pregnancy weigh two to 400 grams less than their unexposed counterparts. And they are at 50% increased risk of being obese or overweight when they're children or adults. So in this case, we're seeing a chemical exposure that is decreasing fetal growth and making babies smaller but then making them grow more rapidly postnatally and then increasing the risk of being overweight or obese. And we're now just have actually finished following up these children age 12 years of age and are going to be looking at the relationship between these chemicals and very detailed measurements of these children's body composition as well as their cardiometabolic health. So it's not all doom and gloom. There's things you can do. And in the absence of sensible um, regulatory actions or policies out there to reduce our chemical exposures or regulate chemicals in the environment, there's things we can do. And I, I divide this into two things. The things on the left are the things that will probably reduce your exposure to lots of chemicals at once. The things on the right are the things that will reduce your exposure to specific chemicals. And you can decide how far you want to go with this. So I recommend if you want to reduce exposure to lots of things, you can put a water filter on your, on your tap water, or you can install one in your whole house if you've got the money to do that. You can vacuum with a HEPA filter. A lot of our chemical exposures come from the dust. We, believe it or not, we ingest about 50 grams of dust per day. So we can reduce our exposure by reducing the amount of those chemicals in our dust in our houses. We can eat a balanced diet. We don't know exactly where all of these chemicals come from and what, what food sources are the uh, biggest contributors. So the best bet is to hedge. Eat a balanced diet and you'll probably reduce your risk of exposure to many of these things at once. <clears throat> also wash your hands. 
right? We put a lot, we get, expose ourselves to lots of things by touching them. And then we touch our face, we touch our eyes, we eat some food, and we're ingesting chemicals that way. And for young children, this is particularly important because they spend a lot of time playing on the ground, getting dust all over their hands and putting their hands in their mouth. I have a one year old right now who won't stop putting anything, you know, will put anything in his mouth that you put near it. Now, you can go further and you can reduce your pesticide exposure by eating organic. You can um, use paraben, phthalate, or petrochemical free products if you want to reduce your exposure to those. And there's a number of companies that are out there doing that. Uh, you cannot use plastic bottles or containers. And you know, carry a metal container with you. It's, it's, it's not only good just because it reduces your chemical exposure, but it's also good for the environment. We don't need to be using so many darn plastic water bottles. Um, you can also not store your food in plastic and certainly don't microwave in it. Um, and purchase flame retardant free furniture. There's uh, now labeling requirements on furniture that say whether or not they have flame retardants in them. You often means you have to tip the couch upside down and look at that little label on the bottom. But you know, if you're really concerned about that, you can look at that. And, and um, manufacturers now label whether or not that furniture contains flame retardants in it. So thank you very much. So we'd be happy to open it up and take uh, questions on, on any, any concerns, questions you might have. Please, there's microphones on both sides. Yeah. Uh, I guess I have a question. I'm curious how like just a, a lay person without access to data and resources can affect public change in the way that, that you guys are describing because obviously like I can do all the personal things, but I'm, I'm just curious like what advice you have for like taking broader action in terms of, I know you yeah. listed a little bit, you know, in the, yeah. like in terms of taking community action, but yeah, just what, what advice you have there for, for increasing our, our impact. Yeah, I think it's great. One of the things we talk about uh, a lot in the class I teach on, on climate and health is you, you need to make these issues personal to the individual. So, uh, you know, we had a student, I think it was uh, in the fall semester, uh, that she says, you know, I, I, I come from a farming family. Uh, you, know, they, you know, we're really concerned about the weather. Okay, so that's great. So, so maybe the impact there is mostly on, uh, you know, your financial, the, the financial uh, ability of your family to sort of make that living. That's the part that's very personal to them. On the other hand, you know, we've had some, some people that have sort of come from very inner city environments and it's like, okay, well, so your house is located right next to the freeway, you know, that's going to be very personal to you or downwind of the industrial facility, that's very personal to you. So I think making it personal to people, to that connection to things that people care about. In Joe's work, it's a lot of it is about kids, which is very personal to a lot of us that have kids. It's how do we protect our children? So it's not about, oh, this is gonna save the environment. That motivates a small number of people, but this is gonna make your son grow up, hopefully a little bit smarter, a little bit healthier, give him a slightly better chance, that's powerful. So have that conversation with people, ask the questions, and then demand that of the people that you elect into office at the local level, at this, you know, your town manager has a lot, in, you know, in Rhode Island, we have a lot of town managers, they have a lot of, you know, power on the local environment, uh, your, your state representatives and your national, nationally elected leaders, they all have uh, the ability to help you with this. So that, you know, that's how I would take local action. I, I would say too, you know, in, in the case of chemical exposures, if you look at something like bisphenol A, which has been in the news for a long time, part of the reason why companies got hip to pulling it out of products was not because of regulatory action. The regulators were doing nothing. It was actually mommy bloggers. So these moms who were concerned about BPA and what it was that it was in baby sippy cups, that it was in sippy cups and baby bottles, and they were really concerned and they were very vocal about that. And manufacturers saw that and they thought, well, people are going to vote with their dollars. And so that's something you can do. You know, if you complain or make that known that you're concerned about it, people will change. Now, I mean, there's a, there's a, it's a double-edged sword in that what we, we play what we call the chemical whack-a-mole game, right? We hit BPA and knock that down, and then they replace it with bisphenol F or bisphenol S, and we don't know anything about that one, right? So this, this goes back to the, to the broader uh, issue of, of sensible chemical regulation. But it does, it does, you can have a voice for this, and, it, and there's a multiplier effect. Don't forget about that. Thank you. Thank you both so much for your presentations. Uh, 
I think as someone, I'm an alum of Brown from class of 1985. Really, really appreciate being here. I think Professor Wallenius, considering that 70% of carbon uh, that is emitted into the air is coming from fossil fuels, I was wondering what you think about Brown's position on divestment. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, it, it, it's a great question. I mean, it, you know, I think to some extent uh, we are a global leader and a global voice on many issues and we can lead by example and Brown is leading by example in many areas of sustainability of developing a sustainable campus and we're moving towards a carbon neutral campus which is a fantastic progress. Uh, I think there, there is room to do more. I think that there are some universities that have moved to divestment. I think that is an option that we could do. Um, and I think that that doesn't actually make that big of an impact in terms of dollars, but it makes such a huge impact in the example we're setting. Uh, so I, I personally support that, but it is a contentious issue on campus. Yeah, I just have a question. So I understand that as science evolves and we have a better understanding of how um, you know, chemicals uh, react your, or how our bodies uh, are affected by chemicals, you know, and, and you know, atmospheric uh, interactions. Um, recently, the EPA announced that they're changing the way they um, calculate the deaths, uh, you know, from uh, atmospheric uh, exposures. And so, my question is, in your opinion, is that? Um, is that due to the evolution of our understanding of how science affects our bodies, or is that <clears throat> more of a, 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 political, uh, a political effect? It, it's purely a political effect. So we know how to do risk analysis really well. Uh, there are people that are, are, you know, scientifically that have been doing this for a very long time. The methods are well established. And I think uh, when you meet, you know, the, the current administration is working hard to change how the EPA operates in order to uh, uh, sidestep some of the regulatory requirements that are there. I mean, it's, it's just that simple. It's if we can change the accounting, then the risk-benefit analysis shows a different answer and a closer answer to what the current administration wants. Thank you. This is awesome work. Uh, a quick question. How many of these go back to the food chain? There are so many things that we seem to have done as humans with the food chain in terms of, you know, either with animals or in terms of introducing things that are completely unnatural, like, for example, all of the beehive deaths and those kind of things. So do most of your studies take you back to some part of the food chain that is, like, completely unnatural? Yeah, no, a lot of these persistent pollutants, that's what's so, you know, it's, it's amazing and, and just sort of heart-wrenching, too, in that, you know, they can go into the Arctic and they'll discover some of these persistent organic pollutants in the fat of polar bears or seals, um, or they can find it in the ice, you know. So, like, these things are not, you know, even though it's emitted by the factory down the road, it gets blown into the atmosphere and travels all over the place. So, you know, we've, 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 We've done things to the food chain as a result of that. And it's not just that, you know, it affects our health because we're ingesting those animals if, if we eat them, but it gets into plants and then it affects, you know, what those animals eat. Um, and then, as you point out, you know, we can also do these things directly to it. The, you're bringing up this example of the colony collapse disorder with this happening with some of these bee uh, populations. And there's some evidence that neonicotinoid pesticide exposures to these bee colonies might actually be responsible for this. And there's some evidence from some researchers at Harvard and other places to suggest that that actually is, is what's happening. So, you know, our use of pesticides to, you know, increase crop yields at the same time might be doing something that's going to, in the end, decrease crop yields because we rely on bees for doing so much of our pretty much doing all of our pollinating as far as I understand, but right, it's, it's uh, you're right, it, it does all tie back to the food chain. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, here in Rhode Island, there's a lot of pushback against developing sources of renewable energy. Um, uh, quite a bit of a not in my backyard mentality that is fighting against wind turbines and fighting against solar panels, uh, solar panel farms. I was wondering if you had any um, thoughts on the policy, how to move that forward, or are they approaching it wrong, or what could be done to make that uh, go better? I, I mean, these issues are phenomenally complicated because uh, in inherently with change comes some people benefit and sometimes some people lose. And 
the ideal policy solution is to find a way that we can achieve a common goal, a goal that we can all believe in, at a minimum cost to those that will be on the losing side of that. So, uh, uh, so in any one of these policies, it's phenomenally complicated to, to do that. I don't have a magic bullet. I, I don't think that there, there is like an answer. I think the answer is open dialogue and listening to both sides so that we can truly understand what people's very legitimate concerns are about their safety, their well-being, uh, their property values oftentimes. And I, I think oftentimes we polarize these agreements to make out the other people to be some kind of monsters, and, and they're not. They're acting in their best interest or what they perceive as their best interest, which is what, in fact, we all do all the time. And so actually just better dialogue, I think, is the only way forward. Hi. I'm interested in some of the choices that we get to make as consumers and trying to understand the complexity of a cradle-to-cradle -cradle system on choices that we might face. Mm -hmm. And one example I'll use is just taking a bag at a supermarket. Mm -hmm. Now, the best one is always to have brought your own reusable bag, but let's say you forgot and you have a choice between paper and plastic. I mean, how, how do we choose between the negative waste impacts of plastic uh, on the one hand, and the higher energy cost of making paper and transporting it because it's less dense. You have to, you know, if you're moving paper in a in a semi a semi semi trailer, you it, I've heard statistics that say you have you can you, you only can carry one fourth of the bag. So right. you have those kinds of costs, and you've mentioned the complexity. But yeah. for us as consumers, how do we make good choices, and how do we do that broadly? So, oh. So, I, you know, the plastic bag example is really interesting because there's actually been some work being done by, by people doing these sort of cradle-to-cradle -cradle analyses. And, you know, on, on bags, it's fascinating because actually in some cases, it's sometimes better to just use that disposable bag if you don't have anything else. And it's sometimes these cotton bags that are the worst, right? Because cotton requires lots of pesticides to be manufactured. It's a very... It's not a dense material like plastic, so you have to transport it. And that they've done, they basically said, how many times would you have to use that plastic bag, to, that ca cotton bag, to make it equivalent to, you know, one plastic bag? And sometimes it's on the order of thousands of times you have to use these reusable bags before you hit, hit what one plastic bag is in terms of environmental impact. And we often don't do that with those reusable bags. So, but I think we need those types of analyses so that, and, and then, uh, uh, the, that communicated to consumers so they understand what they can do. And in addition to that, to, to people like groceries, uh, grocers and, and other retailers to say, here's what you can offer consumers. You know, I think they're, you know, the Mass Massachusetts just banned plastic bags recently. Um, and, you know, but, you know, what's the alternative? Right, you know, so what are people going to do, and is it worse than just having the plastic bags? But if having that sort of communication up front before you have that policy is, is what's essential. Yeah, we also have to be aware that we're solving different problems. If the goal is to minimize the carbon footprint of your grocery store purchase, uh, that might dictate one behavior. And if your goal is to minimize plastic waste, that might have a different optimal solution. So I think sometimes we confuse the conversation by saying this is the best solution. Well, the best in terms of by what metric. So in terms of the carbon footprint, it turns out that the paper bags are probably worse than the thin plastic bags. And it turns out that now there's like a 30% increase in the sales of uh, uh, purchased plastic bags because you know people still have uses for uh, plastic bags, right? And now they can't use the grocery ones. So, so are we really benefiting? It's you know super complicated. I think we're definitely benefiting in terms of reducing plastic waste, uh, but are we benefiting in terms of reducing the carbon footprint of our shopping trips? Maybe not. So data still out on that. And and there's sometimes I think there's a simple message too. And like in this case, it's sometimes just buy less stuff, right? Like I mean, like you know, yeah. you know, we don't need a, a lot of the stuff we buy. We don't need. So I think that that could just be a simple solution to lots of these problems because it's 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 all driven by consumption. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Hi. Um, I'm a brown parent and a brown husband, and uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm glad to be here. I come from Zimbabwe. I grew up on a cotton farm 30 years after DDT was banned and was used in Africa. How many years or decades does science take to undo the damage that science creates in the first place? I mean, all the chemicals I hear today, mm -hmm. how many decades will it take for that message to go to Africa and prevent deaths that you are aware of? 
No, and it, this is, but the, you bring up a great point. It's this, you know, this is the, the way we've always treated chemicals, whether it's DDT, pyrethroid pesticides, which are what they're using in Africa now to for, treat for malaria, um, insect, malaria carrying insects, um, is that we, we assume chemicals are innocent until proven guilty. Right, and so we need to change that. And Europe has been on the forefront of doing that with the legislation REACH, where they're saying, you know what, you have to prove this chemical is safe before you can introduce it in the marketplace. And they're setting a very high threshold for what safe is. And it's, it's the manufacturers are not happy about it. But, it. but it's, you know, I think if that's what, if we think that that's important, we need to enact those policies. I do hope that in the case of REACH, you know, given that it's Europe, there will be spillover effects, so to speak, right? That, you know, manufacturers don't want to make 20 different kinds of products. They want to make one product. And so I'm hoping that we're going to have better chemicals, you know, in, our, in, in, the, in commerce and industry as a result of REACH. All right. So we probably have time for just one last quick question. Thank you. Um, you in your presentation, you, you listed a lot of things we can do individually to help with yeah. um, reducing our yeah. carbon footprint. And, but if we're, if we're going to try to get to, you know, pre-industrial levels of carbon and dioxide in the air, we need to do a lot more than that. And I'm just wondering, something that might help convince the whole spectrum and not just the people that are true believers, is why isn't nuclear power, you know, especially within modern uh, generations, which is much safer, mm -hmm. why isn't that part of the conversation, or should it be? Yeah, nuclear power has an image problem, right? Um, uh, it, it has this, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, which of us wants to live next to the nuclear power plant? You know, we, we have one remaining one here in New England, and, you know, there's, you know, constant bad press about it. Uh, uh, so so I, I, I think there are multiple solutions uh, to the problem. There's not like one solution of we have to do just nuclear. Uh, I think that there's a, a, a tremendous amount of research and energy in, or, or enthusiasm about uh, 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 sources of energy uh, uh, that are not based on fossil fuels. I, I think nuclear could be part of that solution, uh, but it's complicated. And again, you, you're going to have in every situation, you're going to have winners and losers, and we really need to understand what are the downsides of, uh, of whether it be the wind turbines or the nuclear power plants and figure out how we're going to make this manageable, palatable to people and to get them on board to be part of the solution. So there's not, again, there's not an easy answer. All right, so uh, thank you very much for being here, for your time, for your enthusiasm. We'll stay up here for a few minutes to answer your questions. You're welcome.